Hello and welcome back. My name is Nathan House and I am with the Houston Church of Christ in Houston, California. We're going to be back in the book of Psalms today. And if I can encourage you to like or subscribe to this video, that would be appreciated. So we had kind of recently worked through the figures of speech that we see in Psalms. Lots of, lots of different figures of speeches that we see in Psalms. We didn't try looking at all of them. Uh, even the partial list that I shared as we began, I think we did three lessons on that if I remember right. We didn't even go through all of those. But it's always important when you're looking at the book of Psalms, some of the things we've talked about already. Do we see figures of speech? What is the figure? What does the figure represent? What kind of poetry do we see in these lines? You know, you'll see synthetic parallelism, uh, synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism. And there's others as well, of course. So notice these types of Hebrew poetry. Notice the figures of speech that is used. Watch for things like structure. Is this poem... Is it an acrostic poem like Psalm 119? Is it a chiasm, you know, where it works backwards and forwards, right? You know, uh, so ask questions, pay attention like we've talked about. And hopefully those have been of benefit to you. But again, I always do that when you're reading in the book of Psalms. So today we're going to begin actually looking at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. Now, why we're doing this is because some, some Psalms are rooted in, in, in history. And so we're going to see some one of the Psalms we look at today. It is a Psalm that looks back to the promises concerning King David, the promises David himself made, the promises God made to David. And so there are other Psalms too that have this aspect of history and, and promises. And there's definitely a lot of them that are Davidic in that. Uh, and some other, very, a very significant one would be Psalm chapter 110, verse 1. And two, which we actually did a lesson on that as well before. But today we're going to look at Psalm 132. But before we do, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Let's read verses 1 through 3. Now when the king lived, so this is King David, and you can even see this, the heading up here, the, Lord co the Lord's covenant with David. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all of his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now how, see now, I dwell, and notice this word, uh, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So David notices all these blessings God has given him. He has a, he's living in his own house, but the house of God, the, 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 the ark of the covenant. And again, notice this. See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. So David didn't want the tabernacle to be the structure anymore. David desired to do something. Do something bigger. Do something for God. He desired to build a place for God to dwell. And again, you can kind of see that coming through here. Um, so let's go ahead and let's hop over to Psalm 132. I think it's I put it up on this one. And that, that passage we just read kind of sets the stage for this passage. Uh, and so from the, for this Psalm, Psalm 132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor... All the hardships he endured. Now, what hardships is he is he specifically referring to? Perhaps the hardships of trying to build the temple, the challenges that came with that. Perhaps he's referring to other things. Not exactly sure. Uh, but he says, the psalmist begins, remember, asking God to remember in David's favor all the hardships he endured. How he swore to the Lord and bowed to the mighty one of Jacob. So this becomes a significant part of this psalm. David's promise, David's vow. And so you'll see down here in a moment, David made a vow, David swore, and then the Lord swore. So we have, first of all, David's vow, this, this that David promised. David swore to the Lord and bowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Well, first of all, just notice real quick too, this is Hebrew parallelism, right? Just we're talking about this already. What type of Hebrew parallelism is this? He swore to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one. Both of these lines are saying essentially the same thing. Synonymous parallelism. He swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Kind of an interesting expression. This mighty one only occurs five times in the Old Testament. Once, I think five, maybe six. Uh, once in the book of Genesis. The rest are either in Psalms or Isaiah. I think twice in Psalm and three or so times in Isaiah. So kind of a unique expression. But again, this is a, an expression used to describe who? Yahweh. Oh, remember, O oh Lord, how he swore to the Lord. He vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. He was the mighty one of Jacob. He was the one who was with Jacob all the days of his life. Go back and read Genesis 49. This is where this expression occurs. Uh, Genesis 49. Go back and read concerning that. Uh, 
yet his bow remained unmoved, his arms were made agile. How were this, how did this occur? By the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. Go back and read these passages. And again, you can see some of the other places where this expression occurs there on the screen. But he vowed to the Lord. He made a promise. What was the promise that he made? I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So again, this takes us back to the passage we just read in 1 Samuel. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel takes us back to that passage, right? We will look here, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7. He uh, wants to build a place. The ark dwells in a tent. So David wants to build a place for God's ark, for God to dwell. So David made this promise. God, I'm going to work until I get a place built for you. A dwelling place for the Lord, for the mighty one of Jacob. Um, we'll come back to this in a second. Let's hop over here for a second. Um, so here we have, we, we're reading a portion of Psalm 132. We've introduced the Psalm, David's promise made to God about the, about the temple to be built. Now, let's go ahead, and I want to ask a question as we're kind of reading through this. The expression Zion, what does Zion refer to? And so as we come into this, we're going to kind of just pay attention, uh, and we're going to kind of try to answer that question in a minute. So let's go ahead and come back to the text. Psalm 132, verse 6 and 7. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. So here in verse 6 and 7, this seems to be uh, the passages, the idea where David is moving the Ark of the Covenant. David is trying to move the Ark of the Covenant. And there's, you know, there's some interesting passages and interesting stories you can read on that. But this is talking about that journey, that movement process of taking the Ark of the Covenant to the city of Jerusalem. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. And again, what is a footstool? We'll just kind of talk about this momentarily. But a footstool is obviously, obviously it's something you rest your feet on, right? And it's interesting because in Scripture, what is, how does this, how is this used? I believe it's only used in the Scriptures literal, in a literal sense, twice, maybe three times. But it's used over and over in a figurative sense to refer to something that is below God, right? The earth, it talks about, the earth is God's footstool. Heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool, demonstrating the superiority of God. The temple, the ark, they are his footstool. These holy and wonderful, and the, the, earth, the magnificence of the earth, God's footstool. And so again, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. So again, we see again reference to the Ark of Covenant. We see reference to the priests, uh, the resting place of God, the promise, uh, you know, the, the aspect of David in again, this passage, the fact that David is his anointed one. So now we come to, so David swore up here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to rest until I build you your place, God. So now the Lord swears concerning David. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. So again, notice again, do not turn, do not turn away the face, sorry, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore from which he will not turn back. God's promises, right? The, the reliability of God's promise, the surety of God's promise, he will not turn back. So what is the promise David receives from the Lord? David gave a promise to the Lord. Now David receives a promise back. One of your son, one of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. So we have this promise that David's son would sit on his throne. And then we have a conditional promise that if, notice this phrase, if your sons keep my covenants, their sons will always be on my throne. So we have another promise, a promise of David's son, a promise for David's descendants. The second part is obviously conditional. If David's sons keep his covenants and testimonies. Verse 13, for the Lord has chosen Zion. So what is Zion? We'll talk about that more in a minute. But notice this expression. What is Zion? The Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his 
dwelling place. David wanted to build a dwelling place for God. God has chosen Zion. He has desired Zion for his dwelling place. Now here's God speaking in verse 14. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation. Her saints will shout for joy. There, where? In Zion. His dwelling place. All of these blessings. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. What is a horn? This is a figure of speech. A horn is something demonstrating power, right? So the image is a horn. What the horn means something. I will make a horn to sprout for David. I will prepare a lamp. Here's another figure of speech. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame. Here's another figure of speech. But on him, his crown will shine. So we have this uh, antithetical parallelism. Here's where these two lines are set in contrast with each other, if you will. The enemies are going to be clothed with shame. But on this anointed, a crown will shine. So here is this wonderful Davidic passage uh, where we have David making a promise, God reciprocating with the promise. Um, we have these blessings that are bestowed upon David and his descendants. So I asked the question a minute ago, what does Zion refer to? Well, let's go ahead and look at a couple of texts real quick. We we'll hop back and forth um, between some slides. First Kings chapter 8, verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the father's house of the people of Israel before King of Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant out of the Lord, sorry, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So Zion here is a reference to the city of David. Um, that's a very physical reference. Um, but notice this from the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. The name Zion came to signify the mount on which the temple stood. So it came to signify um, not just the city, but even the mount upon the temple. So the so it may be a little more generic at times. So let the context determine the meaning. But the city of God, city of David, Zion, Jerusalem. The mount specifically, again, context will determine meaning to some degree. Uh, the mount specifically where the temple stood. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 22, so here the Hebrew writer says, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. So he's not talking about Mount Zion, the physical the physical Mount Zion. Now Mount Zion is used to refer to something spiritual. You have came to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So Mount Zion is now considered what? The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 23, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all. So we have this aspect of Mount Zion being used here as in a spiritual sense to refer to the city of God, to refer to the heavenly Jerusalem. And now let's look over, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Rev 14. And then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion. So we have this image here. On Mount Zion stood the Lamb. The Lamb is, is in heaven, right? So this is, again, figurative. Uh, this is the heavenly Jerusalem. This is the city of, the he of, of God. So that phrase, Mount Zion, uh, it physically was the, you know, the city of Jerusalem. It came to represent the mount, in a physical sense, the mount upon which the temple itself sat. Figuratively, used allegorically to refer to the, uh, the heavenly city. So again, Zion, again, in, in our scripture is a very interesting study. So what is, what is this? Notice this psalm here as it begins. Let's go back to our text here. Psalm 132. And it's grouped in a group of psalms called Psalms of Ascent. So Psalm 131, Psalm 130, uh, 132, a Psalm of Ascent. All through here, right? Psalm of Ascent, Psalm of Ascent. So what is a Psalm of Ascent specifically? What is this? So here is a quote. Uh, I want to share with you a song of ascent is a heading given to 15 psalms beginning at Psalm 120 and going through Psalm 134 associated collectively with the phrase going up. So it's a psalm of ascent, going up. So there's some uh, different ideas as to what it means, where what is the going up referring to. So I'm only going to share with you two of these possible meanings. There's typically about three or four that are discussed. Um, then notice this, four of these songs, songs of ascent, 
are attributed to David, one to Solomon, the rest are unattributed. Two theories regarding the original settings of these psalms. Here's the first theory. The Mishnah, so this ancient Jewish writing that we have, very well respected uh, ancient Jewish document of roughly 2,000 years old, the Mishnah draws a parallel between the 15 songs of ascent and the 15 steps that led... Uh, wife calling me, muter. <laughs> the 15 songs of ascent and the 15 steps that led from the court of women to the court of Israel in the temple, specifically during the Feast of Tabernacles. So again, you're ascending these steps. You're going into the temple. While the Mishnah does not state where whether the songs were sung on the steps during temple worship, this connection is made, split, made explicit by the Tosefta, by Sukkah. So you can go and you can read some of these things out of the Mishnah. And so, again, what is a song of ascent? There's, here's, here is another uh, option, another theory. The, song of, the songs of ascent may have been used in the context of pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And this is what I've always kind of held to. And again, I don't know that I have a great reason to hold to it, but it's first how I understood it. Hard to get out of how you first understand it. But the Song of Ascents may have been used in the context of pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. The verb go up is used specifically in Psalm 122.4 in the sense of ascending to Jerusalem. So the Songs of Ascents may have been used in the context of pilgrimage to Jerusalem, perhaps even in a broader sense than just the Feast of Tabernacles. Perhaps the pilgrimage to, uh, to Jerusalem later on when Christians, when uh, sorry, when Jews would return to Jerusalem from all over the world, and so these songs of ascent, though, were associated with this coming to the temple, this aspect of worship. And so this song that we are singing here is a song reminding the readers, the singers, of the promise of a temple. David was going to build a temple for God. He wanted to build a temple. Now God tells David, "I'm not going to let you do it. I'll let your son do it because you've shed too much blood." But all of this kind of sets the background to um, this passage, right? So here, just kind of, I take this out of a commentary, just kind of a summary of what's happening. Verses 1 through 5, Yahweh is reminded of David's determination to build the temple. Verses 6 through 10 relate to how the covenant box, or the Ark of the Covenant, was taken into the sanctuary. 11 through 12 speak of God's promise to King David that his descendants would succeed him as king. And verses 13 through 18 praise the temple as the place where Yahweh dwells with his people. Now notice this, the temple, the place where God dwells with his people, the footstool, you know, this is, this is the footstool. God's throne is in heaven. The earth is his footstool. The temple is his footstool. The ark is his footstool. Again, these, these things, God's dwelling place. Again, very powerful images that we see here. So again, we kind of talked about what is a psalm of ascent. Noticed a couple of figures of speeches. We talked about some of the poetry seen in some of those verses. We're going to skip over that slide. What does the psalmist request of the Lord? That he remember David's promise, David's oath. And so we're going to come back here to look at 2 Samuel chapter 7. We're going to skip down to verse 12 through 16. When your days are fulfilled, so now, um, okay, we'll, we'll just go ahead and read it. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body. And again, this is God's promise to David, right? David made a promise to God, made an oath. Now God is giving a, a promise to David. And I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him. And we know Solomon made some bad choices. And, they, and God says, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul. So Saul lost that place, but David's son will not. Saul was put away. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. In accordance with these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. So this is the promise God gave to David through the prophet Nathan. A promise of a throne for his son. A promise of a, uh, a relationship. And that's the greatest aspect of this promise. A promise of a relationship that God would have with the son of David. And so again, we kind of have talked about all of these things. But I want you again to go back and look at, we're going to look at verse 13 through 18 real quickly. Or at least verse 13. Um, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. 
And it's interesting because if you look over here at the book of Deuteronomy, we look at Deuteronomy, what do we see? Notice here verse uh, 5. But you shall seek the place. So he, God here is speaking, and this is again at the time of you know Moses and all of that you know coming before they've land, entered the land, even entered into the promised land. He says, verse 4, let's go ahead and read the beginning of verse 4. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place. There was a place that God wanted worship to occur. You shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose. There you shall go. Uh, skip down here. Look at verse 11. Then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name, look at this, dwell there. God's going to choose a place to make his name dwell there. And so it's interesting here how it's interesting when you look back and read the Old Testament. How did how did the, this location come about? The Temple Mount, the city of Jerusalem. God is working through all of this. It was ultimately going to be the place that God would choose. It was going to be his choice. Psalm 132, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. How interesting it is how all this comes out comes to be, comes to happen, when you read about David and his sins with numbering numbering these men in the book of Samuel and Chronicles, how how, uh, how all of these just happen. They, they don't, but they don't just happen. This is God's will. This is God working these things out in that way. So real quickly, we'll end this lesson with three points just to consider. This psalm reflects the faith of God's people and his promises. The psalmists believed him. They would sing these songs as they ascended to the temple mount, to the, to the temple to worship God. The people of God believed in God's promises. And again, we need to be people that believe in the promises of God. The psalm speaks of the blessings of God to his children. Now, those blessings that we see, they are conditional. They're conditional. God, God gives us blessings, and they are frequently conditional. God causes the rain to rain, God causes blessings to rain to fall on the good and the bad. But spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus, Ephesians chapter 1. God's presence in the temple, this is an interesting one. God's presence in the temple is a foreshadowing of his dwelling with man. They're a foreshadowing of his dwelling with man. Look at Revelation 21. Notice this. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. You come back here, what do you see? A holy city, New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. This new city is prepared and a voice from the throne. Who's on the throne? That's God, Revelation 4. God from the throne says, Behold, I'm dwelling with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God will be with them as their God. How wonderful it is that we have this, this psalm that reminds us of God dwelling in his temple. How wonderful it is that we have this promise that God's dwelling place will ultimately be with his children. Thank you for your time. You guys have a great day. God bless.